Every great story starts with a journey and for us it starts on the North Norfolk Railway, a location much loved by filmmakers shooting period melodrama and of course a featured television location for a warning to the curious, as directed by Lawrence Gordon Clark. Our intention is to explore the vexing question, did M.R. James believe in the paranormal? Much of what has been reported suggests that, on the surface at least, James had an open mind, due largely to numerous of his own brushes with experiences either preternatural or which could be interpreted or misinterpreted as such. Despite what was surely an intellectual wrestling with the possibilities, James never publicly made any admission to such beliefs. Our view is that he did and we hope to convince you that there was so much more depth and secrecy to the character of James which has largely been left unexplored. And so we focus on two stories for our investigation. The original text of O Whistle and I Come to You My Lad and A Warning to the Curious. when I learned more about M.R. James that there seemed to be a feeling that he didn't believe in ghosts um, and had never had a paranormal experience of his own because for me in reading his stories and listening to his stories it came across to me as someone who's been a paranormal researcher for almost 35 years that he was speaking from a perspective through his characters um, of someone that had had a very personal experience with another um, dimension, another layer of experience, you know, that sixth sense. And so I couldn't really wrap my head around the idea that he was just writing stories with no personal experience of these things. And as I learned more about his life and got interested in the details of how he grew up and how his mind developed and his life developed, I began to see in the details that there were very specific experiences that James had, which he interpreted as dreams, nightmares, things in his imagination, which I feel could have actually been experiences that he had with the paranormal at locations where he lived or worked, or that he actually had a sixth sense of his own, that he actually had some kind of psychic functioning that he was aware of from the time when he was very young. But he never spoke much about his past. He never spoke about his childhood in those terms of being frightened by demonic forces or actually admitting to any level of fear. Certainly when challenged about his beliefs in the paranormal, he was quite open to the prospect of the existence of the paranormal should evidence be given to prove it. And yet here, I think, was the sleight of hand by Montague Rose James. I think Monty, deeply believed in the paranormal. I think that he had psychic premonitions, experiences, which he was too afraid to share to fellow academia at Oxford or Cambridge or wherever he traveled, because in, within the academic circles for which he frequented, talk of such matters was regarded as being a little bit weird. And nonetheless, Monty was able to convey those feelings, those thoughts, those emotions, those experiences, and his wonderful ghost stories. So in effect, he was writing as a third party. He was saying to them, this is not me, but these are simply ghost stories about things I thought about. 
but the reality is the underlying score, which treads quietly in the background, is that Monty did actually believe in these stories. Through that hole, a face was looking my way. It was not monstrous, not pale, fleshless, spectral. Malevolent, I thought, and think it was. At any rate, the eyes were large and open and fixed. It was pink and, I thought, hot. And just above the eyes, the border of a white linen drapery hung down from the brows. There is something horrifying in the sight of a face looking at one out of a frame as this did. More particularly, if its gaze is unmistakably fixed upon you. Nor does it make the matter any better if the expression gives no clue to what is to come next. I said just now that I took this face to be malevolent. And so I did, but not in regard of any positive dislike or fierceness which it expressed. It was indeed quite without emotion. I was only conscious that I could see the whites of the eyes all round the pupil, and that, we know, has a glamour of madness about it. The immovable face was enough for me. I fled, but at what I thought must be a safe distance inside my own precincts. I could not but halt and look back. There was no white thing framed in the hole of the gate, but there was a draped form shambling away among the trees. In 1972, another story was adapted, this time by Lawrence Gordon Clark for television, as the second instalment of the BBC's A Ghost Story for Christmas Strand. As with previous instalments, it was first broadcast on BBC One at 11pm on Christmas Eve. It starred Peter Vaughan as Paxton, Clive Swift as Dr. Black, an amalgam of the unnamed narrator and Henry Long from the original short story, and played by John Kearney as William Ager. There are a number of differences between the film and the original short story. The film's opening sequence takes place some 12 years before Paxton's visit to Seaborough and Thruxton, as the towns are called in the adaptation, at a time when William Ager is still alive. It establishes how seriously Ager takes his role as guardian of the crown. In Clark's adaptation, you can quite well imagine the fear that Ager's character generates as he stands high over the archaeologist as some Machiavellian character reminiscent of the statue of the dead commentatore in Mozart's production of Don Giovanni. And of course, as the unrepentant Don Giovanni was dragged off to hell, Clark's character was fittingly hacked to death with a billhook. Another example, perhaps, of James's notion to leave well enough alone. But to understand the fear of being alone in a desolate place, you firstly have to go back to an age without instant communications, or indeed the internet. In these times and places, you are alone and exposed directly to the forces of nature, a place where nobody would hear you scream, a place where your body would not be found for days or maybe weeks. These are places of isolation where the mind accentuates the sounds of the landscape and where hidden eyes are seemingly watching with malevolent intent. Clark drew well on those senses and was able to connect the viewer into the story in a way that made some feel very vulnerable and helpless as in the case of the archaeologist and Paxton. <laughs> 